Good morning all. Could I offer a huge thanks to our previous keynote speakers, the Chief of the Air Staff and the Secretary of State. Uh, I'm Air Vice Marshal Link Taylor, Chief of Staff Capability at Headquarters Air Command. What I'd like to offer today is a capability perspective on information advantage. But before we move on, I'm sure many of you have read Robert Corum's book on John Boyd, known for his theories on the OODA loop, pertinent not just to aerial combat, but to all warfare. For those not familiar, the OODA loop is a series considering observe, orient, decide, and act. And contrary to popular thinking, it's not just the speed by which you go around the loop, but it's a means to get inside the decision cycle of the adversary. A brilliant quote from that book is, the most amazing aspect of the Uda loop is that the losing side rarely understands what has happened. This is where information advantage can lead us, not just in optimizing our own decision cycles, but in denying our, our, our adversaries theirs. Turning to technology, once any technology becomes digitized, everything turns to computer science. Code can be modified, it can be copied, it can be shared, it can be replicated, and it can be hacked. To me, this is key to gaining ever more from what we have in our forces and what we have in service, and often beyond the purposes for which those platforms and capabilities were first or ever envisaged. I'd like to start by just examining briefly a few of our current and future capabilities. Data from space and from our Space Operations Centre, from Filingdales and our part in the Space Surveillance Network. Our rivet joint electronic surveillance aircraft soaking up signals from ad our adversary's communications, radars and systems. Our Poseidon maritime patrol aircraft working alongside the Royal Navy to secure our seas. The E-7 airborne early warning aircraft able to see future threats and build the essential air picture. Our protector unmanned ISR strike assets operating uh, throughout the globe uh, with kinetic and ISR capabilities. Turning to the smaller platforms, our tactical fighters and loyal wingmen, operating as a system of systems. And if I just look at one of those examples, uh, the F-35 DAS system, the deep di distributed aperture system, uh, it's an IR system that has spherical coverage around the platform. Uh, during trials, it picked up a SpaceX Falcon 9 launch and it tracked it through launch, apogee and re-entry. And it did so, it, probably unsurprisingly, it's an IR system and a space rocket is pretty hot, but it did so from over 800 nautical miles away. This demonstrates that many of our capabilities are already digitized. We just need to exploit those capabilities better. And though at the Air and Space Conference, it still looks a little air centric. But turning to the other domains, the data from the sensors is just the same. Whether it's the Type 45, whether it's from synthetics, whether it's from HAPS, low-cost swarming UAVs designed to overwhelm an adversary's IADs, a land headquarters, cyber, or from the sensors of an attack helicopter. Air is both a contributor and a benefactor from any and all of those digitized platforms. And looking to the future, we'll see fewer and fewer digitally enabled capabilities on the battlefield. So our challenge is, how do we connect these systems up much better seamlessly in a resilient network. I had a brilliant session with land colleagues recently uh, when one of the colleagues said, we don't expect a soldier on the ground to task an F-35. And we pondered for a few minutes, well, why not? If a soldier needs intelligence and objective, they should be able to query the cloud. Any sensor, any time, right information, right effect. But let's switch from military hardware to the information world around us. Starting in the bottom left, you'll have all seen Moore's Law, the number of chips on an integrated circuit doubling every few years. That graph is logarithmic, so we have seen 10,000 times improvements over the last 20 years, and we should expect at least the same looking forwards, and that's before we draw in quantum technologies. But more so, look at the clustering in the top right of that chart. These aren't single or development products, they're commonplace, and that pace continues. Switching to the top right, the clock speed of our systems, this time is shown in linear scale and an exponential rise in how fast our computers work. And the fascinating thing on exponentials is it looks like we are just taking off. But when we look back from 2040 to where we are now, it will seem flat like a snail's pace. To the top left, 
the adoption rate is also changing exponentially. This chart shows how long technologies take to reach 50 million users. And look at a few examples. The telephone took 50 years to reach 50 million users. The television, about half that in 22 years. The mobile phone, half that again, 12 years. Facebook took three years to reach 50 million users. And software systems such as Pokemon Go took only 19 days. Finally, to the bottom right, it's estimated by 2020, mankind will have created over 44 zettabytes of data. That's 44 with 21 zeros. Most of it in the last couple of years. By 2025, we will generate half a zettabyte per day. There are 5 billion internet searches every day. 70% of those on Google. That's a lot of information. 500 million tweets every day. 100 million hours of uploaded video every day. And 300 billion emails every day this year. But as the quote on the right speaks to, the cost of these digital products are trending to zero. And if we just jump back to slide two briefly, uh, and we look at the systems we have in service, that's a lot of data every day, every sortie, that the commercial world is already configured to use. What a brilliant opportunity for the military. So turning to our opportunity to build a next generation Air Force and contribute to multi-domain integration. Firstly, our concepts. The digital world is moving exponentially, but our concepts still consider the same time periods. We'll talk to epochs, we'll talk to decades. We'll view progress based on our experience of the last 10 years, not the exponential change we should expect in the future. We need to think in time horizons, not in epochs. That is the time until a significant change. For one area, it might be decades. For others, it will be months. We have sensors generating terabytes of data per second. We will have trouble storing, never mind transmitting. We will need resilient networks. We will need to transfer the data that is important in a resilient way. We will need to automatically tag the data, letting the system know that we have the data and that we can process or transmit on demand if anyone needs it. Processing will have to be done at the edge. We don't want huge, vulnerable data hubs. We need to process data where it sits, ensuring resilience and self-healing connectivity. We would not have, nor would we wish to have, all of our systems from the same company. We will still look to get the same best value in our capabilities, but one of those values will be interoperability in the data those systems generate. We should not mandate standards, but we should ensure that we can translate those different standards so that we can exchange data with services, partners and allies. Data may come with an accent, but we must still listen. Moreover, exploiting artificial intelligence offers choice to commanders and to governments. It can signal adversary intent before their behaviour, offering political choice below the threshold and closing adversary choice. It offers better insight into our own OODA loop, acting more quickly with more insight, more effectively, and rendering an adversary's actions more and more irrelevant. Take the F-35 example that we spoke to earlier. The soldier asks only whether, whether there's been any artillery fire or defences near an objective from the portable device on their wrist. That device then accesses the combat cloud, which passes not only the data stored on that F-35, but highlights the existence of more data from space, E7, Type 45, Apache, that AI suggests might be valuable based on previous queries. Data doesn't care where it comes from, whether it's a, an airborne platform, a float, in space, in cyberspace, or on the wrist of a commando. We have the opportunity for true multi-domain integration driven by information advantage. That artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, we look at things like Go, uh, the, the ancient uh, strategy game. AlphaGo was taught to beat the masters, but AlphaGo Zero taught itself and within three days was better than humans. Within 40 days was better than all programmed machines, but it taught itself. We should not forget synthetics and extended reality. It too is a sort of source of data. We should embrace artificial intelligence, tell us where we are strong, and it should exploit our weaknesses until we learn, become better, more agile, and more adaptive. 
On XR, it's estimated that by using extended reality, we can increase training efficiency by over 80%. The final slide offers an insight to our information advantage journey to date. The previous Chief of the Air Staff had offered you insight to our initial Babelfish experiments, working with what we had and alongside our agile industry partners. Babelfish 3, 4 and 5 concentrate on Typhoon and F-35, sharing data allowing F-35 to operate silently at the tip of the spear. It transported data from F-35 to Typhoon, from Typhoon back to F-35. These were firsts for the UK, but for me the real turning point was the formation of the Rapid Capabilities Office, AIX, in 2019. Since then, our information advantage journey has accelerated. Last year, we built our experimental combat cloud and our Nexus data platform that can ingest data from many sources. Alongside, we developed a micro virtualized server called Raven. At React last year, we demonstrated our first cloud-based apps, Deckard, Defense of the Homeland, Bryant, a recruitment tool for using careers officers. We're working closely with the Royal Navy to deliver a series of experiments in the next year to the same sorts of context. This year, we will build our classified environment and in the next few months, we will launch Babelfish 7, looking to put Deckard, Nexus and Raven onto a Voyager tanker, experimenting with multi-domain integration to understand which areas we wish to develop to full capability. And our immediate aim point is Babelfish X, where we plan to demonstrate true multi-domain integration across all of our domains. Our intent is to complete that within two years and I look forward to briefing you the results in future years. But looking forward to the Tempest in 15 years time, the acceleration in AI is enormous. Being realistic, we're at the very, very start of this journey, but already the acceleration is huge. Our computing power will be many thousands of times greater at reducing cost and will consume a fraction of the power we use today. Our sixth generation system will have data at its heart, be interoperable from the core and be built to share by default. Thank you all for attending virtually today. Air and Space continues to have a significant and critical role in the defence of the UK and of our interests. Our core capabilities will remain at the fore, but it is how we use what we have that is most exciting. We won't do it alone, we'll do it alongside our sister services, government partners and with our allies. It is our turn to make this reality for our warfighters tomorrow. Thank you.